Welcome to Squawk Alley for a Thursday and a Christmas Eve. Joining us at uh, Post 9, of course, myself, John Fort, Kayla Tausche on a holiday shortened session. Dow's down about 35 points. Joining us today as well, angel investor and entrepreneur Jason Calacanis. Jason, good morning to you. Good morning. Merry Christmas, everybody. Uh, same to you, man. Uh, first up, according to the Evening Standard, Amazon has been operating secret flights in Europe, carrying thousands of packages in and out of the UK for the past six weeks. This comes after it was reported that Amazon's looking to distance itself from UPS due to some of these rising shipping costs. Shares of Amazon are still Amazon's looking to distance itself from UPS due to some of these rising shipping costs. Shares of Amazon are still up a staggering 113 percent so far this year, although down a couple of bucks today. And goods is something they are going to try to do on their own or at least more on their own. Is that going to work? Yeah, I mean, you just have to open your eyes and take a look at what's happening. I mean, what they did with Amazon Web Services is a pretty good blueprint for, I think, what they're going to do with Amazon Logistics Services, ALS. Um, you know, I just made that name up. But it's pretty clear that Bezos has no fear. He likes to go big, and he likes to build end-to-end -end solutions, and he's not afraid to lose money, break even for a decade or two. So this is a really big issue, I think, for UPS, afraid to lose money, break even for a decade or two. So this is a really big issue, I think, for UPS, FedEx in a smaller way, because they don't have a lot of Amazon's business. But consumers want to get their items immediately. Same day is going to become the standard. And Amazon, obviously, with well, here in San Francisco and other major cities, people are getting used to two hours for free. So it's a sea change, and it's a big problem for UPS. And it just makes sense, Jason. As we were talking about here yesterday, uh, their, their shipping revenue is growing faster than their shipping costs because they're doing so much uh, logistic services for third-party sellers, which are, are going to be half of their overall volume soon. So they are a logistics player. It makes sense for them to minimize that cost, especially when it comes to moving massive amounts of goods from point to point within their chain or the most high-value delivery to the actual consumer. I mean, this isn't risky for them, is it? I mean, it's, it's absolutely essential to their model. Yeah, I mean, consumers have really gotten used to this idea that they're going to get whatever they want online at the best price, or relatively the best price, and they're going to get it quickly. So this, or relatively the best price, and they're going to get it quickly. So this plays right into uh, Amazon's computing. If I told you that 15 years ago, 10 years ago, you would have laughed because shouldn't that be IBM or Microsoft or Google's business? But it's not any of their business compared to Amazon, who's the number one player in web services. Will we see? in logistics that you know UPS and FedEx become number two and three to Amazon that sounds crazy right now it does not sound crazy uh, to me having watched Jeff Bezos fearlessly you know go into any category including making movies in Hollywood with Amazon Prime and making a phone listen the phone failed obviously brutally the search engine failed brutally but he took big swings there he's bold he's crazy you know when he goes after this stuff and this is core to the business but Jason, it comes, this thread is coming at a time when some retailers are warning customers of potential delays during a holiday season when volume is picking up again. Do you think, maybe I'm being a skeptic, but do you think that maybe some of this messaging is because Amazon doesn't really want any liability? They want to be the good guy in this holiday season, depending on what may happen for some customers potentially seeing packages from UPS and FedEx being delayed? Yeah, that's, that's a pretty good conspiracy theory, but I don't think you're going to start buying jets based upon wanting to place the blame on somebody else. I, I, I think they really are going to go into this business, you know, just like, you know, they, they went into white labeling products and making Amazon basic cables. You know, these are things that when they were a bookseller or a bookseller plus CDs, none of us really considered. But, you know, Bezos has shown that he's got a decade long, two decade long arc when he looks at a business. And, you know, he's emboldened now with the stock price and, uh, you know, having proved that he can move businesses in decade two into profitability. So um, I would be very, very, very nervous if I held shares of UPS or FedEx right now. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, that's uh, well understood. Next up, Jason, the investment firm. Uh, yeah. I, I don't doubt it. Uh, the investment firm of Saudi Quickly. Prince Al Walid announcing it led a group of investors uh, buying 5.3 percent of Lyft for just under 250 million dollars as Lyft is looking to raise up to a billion in a new round of funding that would uh, value the company at 4.8 billion uh, always interesting to watch the prince's moves when he goes in he tends to 
pretty much park and stay for a long time. What does this say to you, Jason? Well, he's no Yuri Milner. I mean, Yuri Milner did Facebook, uh, you know, and, and then some of the bigger companies. I think the Prince, respectfully, um, sometimes picks the number two. Obviously, I've got a horse in this race. I'm one of the early angel investors in Uber. But be very careful if you buy the number two company in a category. Uh, it didn't work so well for Twitter shareholders versus Facebook, and I love Twitter, obviously. Um, and it didn't work so well for Yahoo share shareholders versus Google. You really want to own the number one company. You want to own the Tesla, not the Fisker. So but, uh, dangerous but move to buy number two. If you bought Apple when Windows was number one, right, you, you did okay. If you bought Google early on in the search engine days when it was not number one, you did okay. Uh, what concerns me here is the fact that Lyft seems to be this uh, sort of global strategic player, this, this high ground, this foothold in the U.S. market for all these players globally who want to battle Uber. I, I wonder how much room is Lyft going to have to grow internationally if every country it turns to, it runs into an investor and a partner? Yeah, I, I think Lyft is going to be acquisition bait, frankly. Um, you know, it's, it's a fine company. Uh, you know, they make a solid product. But, you know, the scale is what's critical in this space and the time it takes for somebody to pick you up. And when you look at new products like Lyft Line or Uber Pool, the liquidity of the network, which is to say how many nodes there are on the network, how many cars are on the network, is going to be the key. Uh, you know, you bring up Apple, there's always a caveat with Apple, which is Steve Jobs. Um, you know, and you bring up Google. And what we all saw in Google as an exception to the rule of don't buy number two was Google was a better product from day one. I don't think anybody would say Lyft is a better product from day one. So just always be careful when you invest in the number two because the returns, they seem to, uh, you know, go to the, the number one player. Sure, but Jason, Carl Icahn, which also put a big investment into Lyft, said just because there will be one company in any industry that is perhaps more successful, it doesn't mean that the other company is going to zero and that there's been such a sh seminal shift in the way that people ride in vehicles and buy vehicles that you can't count a number two out when the shift is so large. You disagree with that generally? I, I generally disagree with whatever Carl Icahn is investing in or whatever his investment thesis is. I don't think you want to follow his investment thesis to be re respectfully, again. Um, I think you want to look at, you know, where, where the major venture capitalists and, and some of the other public market people are putting their money. I happen to have a little insight into this because I'm a private shareholder in Uber and I'm getting a lot of people who are uh, I know who own Lyft shares who are selling them or have sold them in the last couple of years and I'm getting you know an onslaught uh, I know who own Lyft shares who are selling them or have sold them in the last couple of years and I'm getting you know an onslaught of people trying to buy my Uber shares of which I've sold zero. Hmm. Well, no plans to sell I assume. Well listen I mean it, if you have a company that has you know dramatic growth uh, where else would I put those that money? Where would you put those shares? What company could possibly grow faster? I mean, it's a small cohort. Um, you know, Facebook three or four years ago, Google seven or eight years ago. So what I learned from Sequoia Capital is, you know, those guys all um, made more money when their companies went public, those private companies, than when they were uh, private. So the lift. Yeah. Uh, sometimes as a venture investor comes after they go public. So you got to be yeah. very uh, long in the business I'm in. Uh, finally, Jason, uh, Medium CEO and Twitter uh, co-founder Ev Williams uh, joined Recode's podcast, uh, the Recode Decode, this week. He talked about the future of media. It was the stance of many people on the board when we started that that it was required to be full time. And and as I've said publicly, we wish Jack were full time, and um, we made we made a compromise to put him in the role, but we thought it was the best choice. Of course, we know about the stock's challenges this year, Jason. We've heard Iger talk to the Journal about whatever it takes to run two businesses, Jack has them. Do you agree? You know, we're going to find out really quick. Uh, you know, watching um, Elon Musk, you know, with SpaceX and with Tesla, and um, Elon Musk, you know, with SpaceX and with Tesla, and, you know, I'm personal friends with him, it's not easy, and he's Elon Musk. So. Um, I, I don't think it's going to be easy for Jack. The, the inside whisper, obviously, has been the board did not want to do this. They didn't find a better candidate. So, you know, two-thirds of Jack's time or half time for Jack at Twitter was better than the other candidates. That says something about Jack's ability. But I think in the long term, Jack's heart is with Twitter, and I think Square is going to become a grinded-out business that will need a different type of leader, not necessarily a visionary leader. Listen, it's doing credit card transactions and processing. I think they're going to need a financial 
you know, CEO, and they'll, they'll find that person and put her in place. The right move for Twitter to compromise now for a year or two while they find somebody to run Square. I think that's the backstory um, that's going on here. We put a lot of, of hope in these charismatic leaders. Marissa Meyer comes to mind coming in at Yahoo uh, years ago. What are we really going to be looking for from Jack, though? You said we're going to figure it out pretty quickly. Is it yeah. uh, the product cycle you think we're going to figure it out from if beyond moments in the next, say, six to 12 months, they do come out with a hit that gets growth going? Well, let's be clear. Marissa is certainly charismatic, but she was never responsible for building any single product. And it turns out she may, based on you know the results from Yahoo in year three and four, not be a great leader of people. It seems like all the people she hired no longer want to work for her. So there may not be a there there when it comes to Marissa, uh, respectfully, you know. Um, but Jack is a different story. Jack is the originator and the creator of products. He created Square. He created Twitter. You can't say that about Marissa. So what I think you're going to be looking for is, can Twitter make something new? Well, they shipped moments, which was obviously you know, in the works before Jack took over the CEO slot. But I bet you that they're going to have a product cadence where Jack will be releasing something significant every four months. If it, you look at Yahoo, they had a little flurry of releasing Yahoo Screen, a new weather app, and some news apps. It was, you know, in the first year or so, 18 months of Marissa's tenure at Yahoo, and then we heard nothing since that time. No new products from Yahoo. That's why Yahoo is a disaster, is because they cannot release new product. It's an antiquated product, and in our industry, if you're not shipping, you're dying. That's why Yahoo's dying. They have not shipped new product. So look for Jack to ship new product every four months in a keynote, and that's how you should judge him. Just like you should judge Elon Musk based on him shipping the Model X, which is a brilliant vehicle. Jason, we love how you bring it every time. Never afraid to call a spade a spade. Uh, thanks for all your good work, and we'll see you soon. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, everybody. Uh, Jason Calacanis.